Another common circuit that you see using just sequential storage devices is trying to mitigate what we call switch bounce in mechanical switches. So first of all, let's take a look at what uh, switch bounce is. So this is the term for these circuits is switch debouncing. And it turns out there's one particular circuit that, uh, that sequential storage devices are very handy for. So when you think about a switch, uh, let's say that you had a contact here and you had a contact here. And the way that it works is you have some switching contact. So you have a, you have, you call this a terminal, for example. But it's got this cantilever in here. It's got this, like, uh, moving contact, okay? And you can think of it as you have this button up here. And when you press it, what's it gonna, it's going to close the switch. So the switch is going to come down and move into the closed position. Well, there's a couple problems with this. Number one, this is a mechanical contact. It's a piece of metal in there. It's a physical device. So it's actually a moving part. And what happens is that when this switch comes down, when this, when this switching contact or moving contact comes down and hits this contact right here, it, it physically bounces back and forth. So it will actually bounce back and forth. It'll come down and then go, it'll come down and go, blah, 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 blah. So it actually bounces off of that. And it'll, find, it'll come to its final value eventually, but just due to the whole cantilever effect of this, almost like a diving board where it comes down and it hits that, and it bounces, and then it comes to its steady state. So that bounce, is, it becomes a problem because the, the speed at which it bounces relative to the frequencies and the, and the speed that we can move electrical signals around, it's very substantial. So it's a very large issue. And so let's take a look at if somebody came along and wanted to, uh, wanted to build some, or wanted to use a switch to create some logic level. And let's see what the phenomenon would be. So I'm going to take a switch and let's, let's take that same switch and let's, uh, Let's draw it on its side, so you have this. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to create a circuit that, I don't know, let's, let's say that when you press it, so when you press the button, so here's the button and I'm going to press it, it creates a logic 1. So we'll go press equals a 1, and then no press equals a 0. So how do you do that? Well, the switch itself is just nothing more than uh, open and closed. It doesn't have ones and zeros in it. So we have to attach it to something to make ones and zeros. So let's take a look at, let's, let's define the point I want to look for a one and a zero to be right here. So I'll just put a little gate right there. And we're, we're trying to figure out, does the gate see a one or a zero? So how do you figure out if it's a one or a zero? Well, when it's open or no press, we need a zero out there. So one of the simplest ways to do this would just be say, well, I'm going to connect it to ground. Okay, well, okay, well that's fine. And then when you press it, you're still connected to ground, so how do you get a 1 on there? Well, a 1 is a VCC, right? So I would want it to, to pull the input to that gate up to VCC. The problem with this, though, is that when this, comes, when this closes, you have a situation where VCC and ground are shorted together. So what do you do there? You can't do that, or else you'll have a, a bunch of current flow, and it'll burn up the switch. Well, it turns out that one of the easiest ways to solve that problem is to simply put a resistor right here. So if you think about it, when it is open, the, there's no current really flowing into the device. So what you'll see is you'll see there's no current through the resistor when it's open. So that means there's no voltage drop. That means that this is indeed, this terminal is, or this node, is indeed at exactly zero volts or ground. So the zero case works great. Then what we do is when you close it or press the switch, <coughs> then you will have current flow between VCC and ground, but you can set that current using V equals IR. So you can say, well, I've got a VCC to minus ground or a full VCC across that resistor, and then what I can do is I can just change the resistor to be whatever I want. And it turns out you can make this huge. I mean, you can make this like 10K ohms because to minimize the current because when you pull it up, it's a direct connection to VCC. So that's the beauty of this, is you can have a very large resistor here to minimize the current that flows between VCC and ground. And when it's open, it works fine, because since the gate doesn't pull any, when the gate doesn't pull any current, there's no voltage drop across the resistor. There's a little bit of current draw, but it's very, very small. And so it's not a big deal on the pull down, but then when you connect it, connect the uh, VCC to this, since it's a direct connection to VCC, you get a logic one. So this is great. This is a very simple way to build a circuit. Uh, it takes one resistor and one of these switches. However, 
what happens when this comes down and bounces back and forth? So it's going to physically bounce. Well, we have a really big problem because if you think about what's going to happen, let's, let's call this SW. So I'm going to press the switch right here. So I'm going to press right here. And it's not pressed. So we're over here, we're in no press zone. So we're at a logic zero. And I'm going to come along and I'm going to press it. So it, it takes a little bit of time for the moving contact to hit there. And all of a sudden, you shorted it to VCC. So great, you went to a one. Except now it's going to bounce and it's going to open up. So now it's going to bounce and it's going to open. So what happens when it's open? Well, it's going to then be connected back to ground. And then it comes back, so now the, the, the lever or the moving switch has now hit it, bounced up, and then bounced back. And now it's going to touch again, and it will connect it to VCC. And it will continue making this transition between 0 and 1 for a while until ultimately it goes to forget I drew that. It goes to the final value, and that represents when it stops bouncing. So this region right here is a serious problem because you have a mechanical switch bounce, that's what we, or switch bounce, also called contact bounce to be more, more descriptive of what's happening within the switch. But it was physically pulling this between a VCC and ground, which resulted in a logic transition. So this is switch bounce. So this is a real phenomenon that needs to be taken care of. Okay, so you go, well, what is, how do I use sequential logic storage devices to do this? It turns out that in order to do switch bouncing with sequential logic storage devices, it, it's applicable to one particular type of switch, and this is not the switch. This was switch was just to illustrate, uh, was used to just illustrate that you had switch bounce. So let's actually talk about, let's really quickly define the type of switches that you have. Uh, the way the switches are, are defined is that you're going to use these two terms and they are called poles and they are called throws. Okay, So what we're going to do here is we are going to have this definition of a pole and you have a definition of a throw. Okay, So <clears throat> what a pole is, I have, to, I have to talk exactly about what a pole is, is that is the number of separate circuits controlled by the switch. Okay? And you see, you know, what do you mean by that? Well, you could imagine that you could have two of these switches within one switch and then have one button control both of them. Okay, so that's, that's a common thing. And I'll draw some of these out here in a second. And then the throw is the number of separate closed positions. Okay? So the switch that we just looked at, okay, this switch right here, this really simple switch, it had one switch, one, one circuit, and it only had one closed position, so it, was, it had one closed. So you would call this a single pole, single throw. Okay, so it had one, one circuit in the switch, which was one pole, single pole. And then you had one throw, which was, it could only be in one closed position. So it's either open or closed. So the opposite, of, or uh, the complement of that would be a single pole actually before we do that one let's do the uh, let's do the uh, double pole single throw so to look at a pole so you're like what is a pole how could you have two of these well here's what this would look like you might have a switch here and a switch here and then there's one button that is pressed and it changes both of these switches at the same time okay so that would be a double pole single throw so there's the the throw, it's only, it's each circuit only has one closed position, but there's two of them in the same switch. So that's very common. That's a double pole single throw. Okay, so then let's look at a, uh, let's look at this single, single pole double throw. Now double means that there's two closed positions. So what kind of switch is that? Well, it turns out that you would have something like this, where your button press will move this contact back and forth between these two closed positions. Okay? And this is, this is really the one that we can use sequential logic storage devices for. Okay? So then this a double pull, double throw 
would be something like this, where you'd have two of these in one in one part. And then the button, the button basically moved both contacts to their final position. So that's the, the th pull and throw terminology. Okay, so let's take a look at how you'd solve this. First of all, this situation right here can't be solved with a sequential logic storage device. And the reason is, is that you are driving it to a VCC and you're driving it to a ground. So the only way to really solve this is to try to put some sort of circuit in here which would dampen these out. And it turns out that you can use kind of like a resistor and a capacitor and try to change these transitions into something that kind of looks like just kind of slurs it over, and then you can use a, a concept of hysteresis. But those don't have anything to do with sequential logic storage devices. Let's look at the one that the sequential logic storage device helps with. And that is actually going to be the single throw, or single pull, double throw. So this is going to be the single pull, double throw switch. And here's what we have, okay? Here's the big problem with this. If I came along, and I'm going to do that same example where I have a gate. Let's, let's not make it inverted, let's just make it a regular gate. And I'm going to take this, and I've got my switch, and I'm like, okay, well, I want, to, I want to try to create a 1 and a 0 by pressing this. So I take this, and I go to VCC, and I take this, and I go to ground. Well, it turns out you don't even need a, you don't even need a resistor in this one because it's kind of neat because it's either going to be connected directly to VCC or it's going to uh, transition down and be connected directly to... Uh, ground. So you either pull it up or you pull it down. However, there's a really interesting new phenomenon in a single pull double throw, and that is called the break before make characteristic. And that's the big issue, is when you move the switching contact from this first terminal to the next terminal, there's a situation where you are right in the middle and you are not connected to VCC and you're not connected to ground. So what is the actual value? Well, you, who knows? You actually have the input to this gate being floating. It doesn't have a value on there. And you don't know what it's going to go to. The transistors within this device will pull it to some value, but you don't know what it's going to be. So if you, looked at, if you looked at the timing diagram of this, you would have, let's say we're going to press the switch right here, and let's say that it was, it was at a 1 and you pressed it to move it to a zero, it's going to go in, it's going to have a moment in time where you have no idea what it is. So this right here, you can say that the contacts are not maked, they are braked. <laughs> so this is where it's floating in between those two terminals. So you don't know what the output of the circuit's going to be. Now, what will happen is that then it reaches the ground, and it's now a ground. It's a zero, so life is good, except for the fact that you still have contact bounce. So it's going to hit this and bounce back and forth. And where does it bounce to? It doesn't bounce all the way back up and hit VCC. It bounces into the break region. It bounces into the region where you don't know what it is. So what the switch bounce manifests itself as a bunch of these little unknown output regions that eventually, they eventually settle out and you'll, you'll see the reach value. But you actually have two phenomena that are happening. You have break before make, meaning that the contact switch goes into uh, no man's land while it transitions from the f first terminal to the second. And then you still have contact bounce when it hits the final terminal. But the bounce in this case, it doesn't bounce all the way back to, to a one. It bounces into the unknown region. OK, so what is a circuit that will solve this? Well, let's take a look at a NAND debounce circuit. And this is the most common switch debounce circuit that is in use today. And I'll show you just a drawn schematic to try to get this, to get this uh, just because it takes a, kind of a long, long time to draw. But this is a NAND debounce circuit for a single pole double throw switch. Okay, so let's take a look at how this operates, and let's do it for, let's do it for an unpressed situation, okay? So in this situation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the switch, and I'm going to connect its switching contact to ground, okay? I am going to use an S bar, R bar latch to hold the prior value when it goes into the no man's land, okay? And then I'm going to have my output come out of the bottom one, come out of QN. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these, these weak pull-ups. Okay? So they're weak in the terms that if I have a pull-up here and I am driving the switch to ground, 
the ground winds, okay, even though this is pulling it up, it's this terminal, this line right here, is connected to ground, so it puts a zero onto that NAND gate. But what happens when I'm in the middle? So once it transitions and goes in the middle, then it's in the break zone, and these pull-ups will then pull it up to a one. But let's take a look at what happens when it's in this closed position, this unpressed condition. Well, I'm going to have a zero being driven by the switch to ground on S bar. Well, what's the other one? Well, I have a pull-up resistor, which is nice because then that drives the one, drives a one into the other NAND gate. So now you ask yourself, well, what does the S bar, R bar last do? Well, I brought the truth table over for you. You have S bar and R bar, you have a zero and a one. That is the set state because remember an S bar latch asserts when S bar is a zero. So you set it and the output Q goes to a one, Q bar goes to a zero, and you have a zero on the output. So you, you built a big circuit to basically do nothing at this point. You had a zero on the input, ground, and you got a zero on the output. So we, we life is good. Okay, now let's take a look at when you press it. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the exact same thing, except now I'm gonna press the button, okay? Well, here we go. We're in no man's land, okay? We go to no man's land, and nothing is driving S bar or R bar, except for the pull-up resistors. So that, those pull-up resistors put this into a state where S bar is a one and R bar is a one. Guess what? That is the store state for an S bar R bar latch. So this is great because it will hold the last value, which is a zero in this case. It was a zero to begin with, then it went to a zero in, it's holding the zero as it goes through this, and now let's take a look at what happens when you get to the pressed state, okay? So it's like, okay, now I'm at this state where I made it to the final contact, and I'm gonna transition now, I had, I have a zero now down here, okay? And forget that little guy for a second. So I have a zero right there, which is driven by the switch, I don't have anything connected to S bar, so the pull-up resistor pulls it to a one. Well, what do I have there? I'm in the S bar, R bar equals one zero. I'm in the reset state, because the reset is asserted when R bar is zero. So that then resets, it, sets, it puts Q to a zero, and, it, and Q bar goes to a one. Well, guess what? That's what I wanted. I pressed the button, and my output went from a zero to a one. And this worked really good because, if you think about what happened, let's look at the entire picture here. Um, I went from having a zero, when I went into the break zone, it held the zero due to the behavior of the storage capability of the S bar R bar latch and these pull-up resistors putting it into that state. And then what happened is once I got to the last step, it drove the S bar R bar latch into the reset state, which got me an output of a one, which is what I wanted when I got to this pack when I got to that position. So I've solved the break before make situation. Have I solved the contact bounce though? The answer is no, because when it gets down here, it's gonna bounce back and forth. So we go, what, what am I gonna do about the bouncing? Well, I said no, and I meant yes. <laughs> I'm gonna have this output right here bounce back and forth between a zero and a one. And you go, well, I, I see the zero. Okay, the zero is when you're pulling it to ground. That makes a lot of sense. The contact is touching it, and it is now going to a zero. So I get where that comes from. Where does the one come from? The one comes from the situation where this switch is in the no man's land, and the pull-up resistor is driving it to a one. So as this bounces back and forth, you'll go zero pulled to a ground, one from the pull-up resistor. Zero pulled to ground, one from the pull-up resistor. So the question then becomes, I'm trying to produce a one because I press the button, does this matter as I bounce back and forth? It turns out that what it's doing is going between the reset state and the store state, which simply holds it at a one, it either drives it to a one in the reset state, holds it at a one in the store state. Drives it to a one from the reset state, holds it at a one, so it bounces back between these two states, that's perfect because now you're staying steady at a one. So the timing behavior of this, it, this actually solves all the problems. So all the, this whole time when you were transitioning between your broke behavior where the contact switch was in the middle and not being driven to anything, we solved that by putting it, by using pull-up resistors to put the S bar of our latch into the actual, uh, actual uh, 
store state and got rid of that. So this circuit, this is a NAND bound circuit, and it, it works for single pole double throw switches, which are a very common switch, and this works very well, but it's all based on this whole concept of trying to store the last value, okay? So that is a NAND bound switch.